the iconic and historic Central High School in Little Rock. Events here in 1957 put Arkansas in the national headlines and changed the course of education for the state. More than 65 years later... It truly is a roller coaster. Uh, education is uh, dynamic and you must change with the times. New arguments that are not so black and white. I can't teach students like I taught them 26 years ago. It's just not going to work. Wondering if we can send our child to school should not be one of those things we have to think about. I have a straight A student, I have a kid who's in band and doing all these great things, and yet he's not welcome here. Arkansas families now on a crash course to understand a new system, Arkansas Learns. And I don't think that there's an Arkansan out there that doesn't want to see something different. And I think Arkansas Learns gives us the best pathway forward to do it. Tonight, we take you on a journey to see how steps we take now will change the path of education again in the natural state. This is Schooling Arkansas, the Education Challenge. As school bells ring on a new school year in Arkansas, thousands of families are sending their students off to class with a lot of questions. Good evening, everyone. I'm Donna Terrell. And I'm Laura Monteverdi. What will this new school year be like? Will my child make new friends? Will he like his teachers? Or what new things will she learn? Or how will they be accepted by those who don't understand them? Tonight, we hope to answer some of your questions or give you a better grasp on topics you may not totally be sure about. One thing that is for sure right now is Arkansas Learns is the law of the land for Arkansas. The new system has several parts, almost like a merry-go-round, each part just as important as the next to ensure students are successful. Learns is spelled out in six key points, literacy, empowerment, accountability, readiness, networking, and safety. Two people run the schoolyard when it comes to education in Arkansas. Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders and Education Secretary Jacob Oliva. Oliva declined to speak with us for this special due to an ongoing lawsuit over the Learns Act. Meanwhile, Governor Sanders remains outspoken for her key piece of legislation. She signed into law within two months after taking office. One of the governor's main focuses is literacy. And we will show you tonight, the numbers around the country and here in Arkansas are just not good. Some families will argue that children in Arkansas are facing many burdens in their home life that can have an impact on their ability to learn. There's no doubt that every student that comes into a classroom is coming with their own unique set of challenges. That's why giving more opportunities instead of putting each student with a blanket, this is the only way forward, is never gonna work. I'm a parent, I only have three kids, but I can tell you with just my three, they all learn differently. They all need different things. That's why Arkansas Learns is so critical because it opens up a number of different opportunities so that every kid has the ability to find their pathway. How best can they learn? But how is Arkansas Learns tackling the issue of reaching every student in Arkansas? That is one of the overall issues of education in Arkansas, making it accessible and fair for all students. We're not done hearing from Governor Sanders just yet. We will hear more from her on why she thinks this reform package is what Arkansas needs and why she thinks this is what Arkansans want right now. What we are witnessing now are the results of how our laws and leaders have impacted learning and funding. Here's a quick history lesson. Governor Mike Huckabee, the 44th governor of Arkansas. He served as governor from 1996 to 2007. His educational programs in the 90s and educational challenges into the early 2000s still have a strong influence on our school system now. After Huckabee, you have Governor Mike Beebe. He also made improving our education in Arkansas his top priority. And as Attorney General, he was part of the legal fight over the state's public education system that also involved his then boss, Governor Mike Huckabee. 
When it comes to funding Arkansas schools, these two men play a major role in setting the foundation for what we have now. How do you study a life? The education system in Arkansas can certainly be called that. A living, breathing, changing thing that continues to evolve. Something that was born and born again and went through the growing pains everyone does. But to think about how we got from then to now, that takes a different kind of study. It's time to close the history book and go straight to the source. Two men, two administrations, one problem. Education. Education. First of all, thank you again for, for agreeing to talk about this. Former Arkansas governors Mike Huckabee, a Republican, and Mike Beebe, a Democrat, both plagued by similar problems when trying to give the state's education system an A. The biggest challenge that I inherited was the Lakeview case that was uh, in the courts for almost 20 years. The Supreme Court ultimately ruled that the state was unconstitutional in adequacy and equity, and they were right. They were 100% right. Adequacy and equity. Issues brought to light through the Lakeview case that tackled the issue of funding, forcing the state to go back to the drawing board to make sure all school districts were treated and paid fairly. Some of the proposals were controversial, bold, but yet necessary if we were going to get to court compliance and to a system that would be fair to every student in the state. But those two words would prove to stretch beyond just one administration, the focus of Huckabee's successor in a different way. It solved that issue for a while and created equity in school uh, funding. And then Lakeview 2 came along and said, well, that's fine, except you've got to deal now with facilities, uh, buildings, and some equity and adequacy in that. And it has to be adequate with curricula and other requirements. So we solved that problem. Uh, and it's still uh, in compliance today. But like any good math problem, solving for one variable doesn't mean the equation's over. And for both governors, a test aced also meant a test failed. What do you feel was your greatest success? And what do you feel like was your greatest failure? The greatest success was selling the idea that we needed to raise standards, not keep them low or even worse, lower them. Secondly, measure and not apologize for it. Keep score. And third, hold the stakeholders accountable. Don't just say, okay, if you continue to fail, everything's fine. We put a big emphasis on STEM uh, because science and technology and engineering and math were, uh, were really coming to the forefront with regard to requirements for uh, tomorrow's jobs. And uh, so uh, significant monies were poured into and significant requirements were added uh, for STEM education. Is there anything that you would do differently? I think the greatest frustration was that when we pushed for administrative consolidation, the resistance to that was intense. You always want more resources. You'd always like to have more summer programs. We had some of that, we didn't have enough. But although Huckabee and Beebe had differing ideas, successes and failures, their stories intertwined to create a full picture. And choices made by both men only add to the complicated history that's Arkansas schools. Right now, wh what do you feel is Arkansas's reputation for education in terms of a national stage? I suspect Arkansas suffers, as many southern states, from a stigma that uh, nationally that we're somehow less uh, advanced. I don't think that's true. Uh, I don't think that's fair. Uh, I think we have progressed significantly along the, the way, and I think we can compete. Unfortunately, Arkansas's reputation is not sterling. Uh, it's because we've had inconsistent results. I think there have been moments of progress, but I think it's been stops and starts. A lot of times uh, the political pressure has blunted some of what would have been uh, longevity of pro uh, progress. So what happens now? After all, the purpose of studying one's history is to learn from it. And with history seeming to repeat itself, the reflections of our past are now all the more important. A new administration is in power now and they are also trying to tackle the issue of education. Sure, sure. What's kind of your mindset today? If it turns out that it doesn't truly improve, you know what, we can always go back to the old system. But if the old system isn't delivering great results and you don't see the majority of Arkansas students reading at grade level, performing, 
going to college and not having to go through remedial courses. If that's what's going on, why not put some new things on the field and, and try something? When it comes to education, there are, there are some of the same old things, uh, such as uh, qualifications for teachers, teacher pay, uh, the ability for uh, schools to be able to provide the, the broad curricula. Education is uh, dynamic and you must change with the times. Change, something both men can agree on. The need to try and try again to make the grade. And as Arkansas looks to a new chapter in the history books, one thing's for sure. The life story of education in Arkansas is one still being written. We've only brushed the surface of what's become the educational landscape in Arkansas, and we still have much more to explore. Still to come, schooling Arkansas to a higher standard. You're going to always have some stumbling blocks, but with faith, patience, and prayer, it always supersedes the negative. I'm going to do everything I can to love them first teach them second. That's always been my motto. How does who's in control of a school district determine the future of its teachers and students? And the battle of new school versus old school. What's working in the classroom and what's not. Where Arkansas education is heading now, we can only predict as we take the first steps in this journey under learns. It's like the classic paper fortune teller that many of us remember from a time before laptops and tablet screens. Each piece reveals a hidden message and what's inside could determine whether our students and our schools succeed or fail. In Arkansas, test scores are still down from pre-pandemic numbers. Here's a look at the data from the most recent ACT Aspire tests for students between third and eighth grade. As you could see, less than 50% of students met the benchmark in math, science, or reading in the 2022 through 23 school year. In 2018 to 2019, Arkansas students stood out in the English portion of the test, although still dropping behind last school year. The same downward trend can be seen for high schoolers, but for this group of students, the math portion had the lowest amount of students reaching the benchmark at 32% before the pandemic and 23% post-pandemic. On a good note, though, high school students hitting the same high marks in English as their younger counterparts. The 2022 to 23 school year was the last year students in Arkansas had to take the ACT Aspire test. The Arkansas Department of Education is developing an Arkansas specific test called the Arkansas Teaching and Learning Assessment System or ATLAS. Students will begin taking this exam in the spring of 2024. And if learning loss is the push to improve education in Arkansas, literacy is the main driver on the course to victory for students, and students aren't the only ones being scored. Report cards are an important way to measure how a student is faring at the end of each school year. Schools are measured with their own report cards here in Arkansas, and when a school shows that it isn't doing well, that's when the state steps in. Looking at last year's report cards, 30% of schools made D and F grades. To help tackle part of why those schools were handed a failing grade, the state is putting together a team of literacy specialists to directly coach all kindergarten through third grade teachers. These literacy specialists will equip teachers with what the state says is new high quality instruction materials that promote evidence based literacy instruction aligned to the science of reading. The aim is to recruit 120 of these specialists, but the governor tells us that so far they've only hired 75. We talked about learning with some of the people that know the most about it, teachers. They are the head of the class. And whether it's a newcomer or a seasoned vet, they have one mission in common, and that's putting their students first. 
For years, teachers have been trying to keep the spark in their classroom. At Cabot High School, chemistry teacher Kim Ussery has seen firsthand. I can actually write on it. The remarkable difference of teaching from the 90s to now. I thought, oh, I'm just going to teach the same way I always did. I've got my transparencies made. I've got my lessons done. I've got my copies done. And then boom. Here comes computers. I'm like, oh, going into her 27th year, she's seen her classroom become more tech savvy. We have to be adaptable. We have to move with the changing. You can't I can't teach students like I taught them 26 years ago. It's just not going to work because her students over the years have also become more user friendly. You know, I could give them a series of homework problems back in 1997 or even 2000 and they're going to come back with that completed and they're going to have learned something. But nowadays they can go home and they can look that up. A constant battle. We need to get kids back to thinking for themselves and not allowing the technology to think for them. And so I am I am a big proponent of paper and pencil. I like to see what my kids are doing and writing it down. I feel like you have very um, different types of learners and you have to know that. Hoping by blending old and new school, it will help her students of today. <laughs> First grade teacher Caroline Fault is beginning her first year at Ward Central Elementary. When the kiddos come in, they don't really know how to type or anything like that. But luckily in the Cabot School District, we have computer teachers. Fault says it was having past teachers like Miss Ussery who helped her on her career path. Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, yes, yeah. I did. I... They put so much work into me and like made me feel comfortable, made me feel empowered. Even though changing with the times has not been easy. That's the entity of our profession, you know, and that's why it's so hard. And that's why people are people are leaving the profession because it's, it is getting harder. Um, but I'm in it for the long haul. Usri says there's one thing that's never wavered. Love kids first. If you love kids first, then everything else falls into place. Thought looking forward to carrying that love with her. This is something I'm going to be doing for communication this year. It's called Classroom Bingo. Um, what the kids kind of do is it says right here, like, I have a pet at home. And so the kids are going to walk around and go talk to their fellow classmates. I have a book over there called Our Class as a Family, because that's truly one of the most important things in teaching is creating that classroom environment. Over the years, Usri says the pay has changed, but her passion has not. I've gotten salary increases, but um, you know, the way the teaching profession works is, you know, I'm I'm going to be maxed out at this point. So even though I continue to do my job, I'll never get a raise. Or I, our school district is really good about trying to supplement that. But if you go by what state standards were, um, I will max out at some point, right? Because you have to. And so even though I continue to do my job, I won't get an increase. But I know that going into it. Okay, I'm choosing to come back because I love what I do, but it's not for the weary. I teach 150 kids a day and I make it my priority to talk to all 150. I've taught over 4,300 kids in my teaching career. Seeing the difference in what's needed to help her students then to now. Social and emotional has is probably one of the biggest areas that we need to help our kids with right now. Um, I don't feel like back in uh, my first years of teaching that we had to deal with those issues as much. The title of teacher constantly changing. Sometimes we're their counselor, sometimes we're their teacher, sometimes they're, we're mom, sometimes we're the cafeteria worker when they need snacks. But what's remained the same through the years? It's about the impact. Um, it's about making that impact in their lives because teaching has more power than what's seen. Honestly, just being there for your students. You know, we can either make or break a student in one day and from the first day to the last. <laughs> Every kid that walks into your classroom deserves a champion. School choice is also one of the many expanded and most debated pieces of Arkansas Learns. Arkansas is now one of more than 30 states offering some sort of school choice program. That's according to Ed Choice, a nonprofit that advocates for school choice. One of the latest controversial changes to Arkansas curriculum regards the AP African American Studies course. The state decided just before the new school year to not consider this course for college credit and said it may not count toward the state's high school graduation requirements. However, many high schools across the state are continuing to offer the AP course. Some schools also say they will continue to pay for the exam 
just as they do with other AP classes. On August 21st, Education Secretary Jacob Oliva sent a letter to five superintendents who are offering the class at their high schools. In the letter, Oliva says, quote, given some of the themes included in the pilot, including, quote, intersections of identity and resistance and resilience, the department is concerned the pilot may not comply with Arkansas law, which does not permit teaching that would indoctrinate students with ideologies such as critical race theory. The old saying goes, follow the money, but sometimes where the money leads can lead to more questions than answers. If we were to lose that school district, it would pretty much, what I told people, would turn the lights off in the community. By the end of two years, once we get to year three, that's where the big question mark comes on where the money's gonna come from. Coming up on Schooling Arkansas, we're walking the tightrope of the state's financial journey to keep up the funding for schools and teachers, all while trying to compete on a national scale. now for a quick rundown on the cost of the LEARNS Act. You'll need a calculator for this one. The LEARNS Act will cost the state $297.5 million in the first year, with $150 million of that coming in the form of new spending, according to a study by the Arkansas Department of Education. In year two, the cost will increase to $343.3 million, including $250 million in new funding. Pay for teachers will cost the state $180 million. The law's voucher program will cost $46.7 million in the first year, $97.5 million in the second year, and an estimated $175 million in the third year. So where's all the money going and who's fronting the bill? Finding the answers won't take you getting a degree in mathematics, but it does take some problem solving and investigating. Okay, where is this money coming from? It's a question many have had from the beginning and one that still may not be answered as Trevor McGar digs through a law that could impact his life. You know, some of this sounds pretty good, pretty interesting, but I'm like, I need to wait and see what the details actually are. McGar has been a teacher for seven years. He started looking into Arkansas Learns shortly after this moment. Education reform will be the hallmark of my administration. Deemed a bold and conservative education reform by Sarah Sanders herself, the new law has a price tag of more than $600 million in its first two years. And at the top of the bill, teacher pay raises. That alone is going to be an astronomical number. The reform plan raises starting teacher pay from about $36,000 to $50,000 a year. It also gives those making that an extra 2,000 bucks. For them, a lot of them are experiencing a, a 14 to $10,000 pay raise. The total cost year one is $180 million. According to the State Department of Finance, that money is coming from a combination of the state general revenue, America Rescue Plan funds, and the Educational Adequacy Fund. Scott Hardin with the ADF says they worked closely to determine the amounts required for each district and each salary increase has already been funded in full. They've said for two years where the, the funds are going to come from for the funds, uh, but then there's no clear answer as far as how school districts are going to be able to continue to pay that $50,000 minimum. Second on the receipt is what's called the education freedom accounts, money that students can use to go to private school or learn from home. In year one, this will only be offered to students who attend F-rated schools or in foster care, have a disability, or a parent in active duty military. This also includes all kindergartners. The state had put out that they thought the first year it'd be probably between 46 and 47 million dollars. Uh, because they put a cap on the number of students that can participate. Each voucher will be calculated based on 90% of what the state pays the school for that student. Right now, it comes out to about $6,600 that can be used for tuition, uniforms, testing, and supplies. In year two, the amount paid will double to $90,000 
as they allow more students into the program. Kimberly Mundell from the Arkansas Department of Education says funds won't go directly to parents, but instead into an account that the school can pull from on a quarterly basis. The Learns Act then goes into funding maternity leave, scholarship funds, literacy coaches, and tutors all pulled from the General Fund, Rescue Plan, and Education Adequacy Fund. A $297 million bill, Governor Sanders and her team will be fronting for classrooms in the state. This year, more than 80 Arkansas private school providers have been approved by the State Department of Education to accept students who qualify for education freedom accounts. The Education Department estimates 7,000 students will enroll in the Educational Freedom Accounts program in the first year, 14,000 in the following year. 20 years ago, the state was tackling how to make education equitable and adequate. Now it's taking advantage of a new way to transform underperforming school districts and evolve under a new standard. Half of us are trying, and so you can't really take just one score and just say all kids are failing because that's not true. How the Marvel Elaine School District is being given new life under Arkansas Learns. You cannot explore this new education landscape in Arkansas without talking about the pioneers. Under the LEARNS Act, the Delta District becomes the first to enter a transformation contract to avoid consolidation. It's made up of the Marvel Elaine School District and the Friendship Education Foundation. The Marvel Elaine District has less than 350 students and the lowest performance grade possible for a school. It also has the second highest per student spending for a public school behind the Earl School District. All of this made it a perfect candidate for consolidation in some people's eyes, but not for everyone who lives there. Inside the Delta, communities are few and far between, and the fears that could only get worse. With this school not being here, this town would just go down, completely down. Felicia Powell graduated from the Marvel School District before the Elaine District consolidated with it in 2006. Marvel Mustang, class of 88. Since her graduation, both towns' populations have shrunk by more than 40%. And last year, the State Board of Education voted to implement a state law which would have made things worse, requiring a school district with less than 350 students for two consecutive years to consolidate into one or multiple districts. Another contributor to the state's vote is the fact that Marvel Elaine gets some of the most money per student but they're academically toward the bottom. They were under a lot of stress. I know my daughter was, along with me as a parent. It made me feel bad, because I know some kids, well, half of us are trying, and so you can't really take just one score and just say all kids are failing, because that's not true. Senior student Amaya Thurman shares her mom's fears, knowing the next closest school district could be 30 miles away, adding an hour to bus rides each day. If we would have to go to school like an hour or so later, then that wouldn't have been good for nobody. It wouldn't have been good for students at all. Mon Rawls has represented the community as Justice of the Peace for the past year, and finding a way to save the school and the town was his top concern. People kept asking me when I was running for office, what would I do to help keep the school open? He found his solution in the LEARNS Act, specifically a section that allows low-performing schools to become transformation campuses by contracting a third party to run the school. It could be a charter school, education cooperative system, or other organization as long as they receive the state board's approval. And they did. It's national news-wise story is what we called it. If Marvel came from the bottom to even the middle or the top, it would show that the transformational contract would work. The easy thing for us to do would recommend is just close the district. In July, the state voted to take over the Marvel Lane School District and went forward with its contract with the Friendship Education Foundation to turn over all operations, including the hiring and firing of faculty, staff, or administrators to the company. The move happened only weeks before this school year, presenting new challenges. As you can imagine, it's hard to find teachers at the end of July when school starts 
in three or four weeks at the time that they were allowed to start hiring. Rawls said some teachers waiting on a contract went elsewhere and a few students opted for school choice during the limbo. But the school district is Marvel's largest employer. And for Powell's children, a student, a teacher, and a coach, she's thankful they'll be able to stay where they live. The new Learns Act, that helped us a whole lot. It saved us, and I appreciate that. The Delta District, now one of many players in the Learns Legal Limbo. Still ahead on Schooling Arkansas, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders lays out why she wants to be known as the education governor. Not only were people supportive of an overhaul of our education system, but of the specific one that I laid out. Otherwise, frankly, I wouldn't be sitting here right now as governor of Arkansas. And also, because of some of the more controversial laws passed this legislative session, why the way students live their lives outside of the classroom is becoming a new legal challenge. In the five months since Governor Sanders signed Arkansas Learns into law, there have been several legal fights over what's in it and how it should be implemented. The arguments in our homes over what works for our kids, while the battle in the courts have focused on the formalities of how the Learns Act became law. What may seem like a simple solution to the education challenge is anything but. From the beginning, this has been and still is a simple case. But the twists and turns in this story have complicated everything. It's frustrating that instead of simply following the Constitution, the state has attempted to circumvent those requirements at every step. Arkansas's Constitution requires that emergency clauses be voted on separate from the legislation they're presented with. Attorney Ali Nolan argues that never happened here. The Constitution says separate votes. The video shows one vote. It's pretty simple. It wasn't done in accordance with the Arkansas Constitution. Nolan, representing the group CAPES, also argues that an emergency clause does not give groups like these enough time to repeal the law through a referendum, meaning letting citizens decide in an election. What's at stake is really whether Arkansans have any meaningful um, mechanism to require the state to follow the Constitution. Nolan's lawsuit has landed Arkansas Attorney General Tim Griffin at the center of this fight in defense of the Learns Act. He says while there was one simultaneous vote on the bill and the emergency clauses, they were recorded in the two separate journals of the House and Senate. And he says that's how it's always been done. This is a really important issue that we need the court to decide. The lawsuit has seen several rounds in Arkansas courts. A Pulaski County Circuit judge issued a temporary restraining order back in May to pause the bill from playing out until a permanent decision could be made on the emergency clause. Griffin appealed that. And the state Supreme Court ruled in his favor. Then the same circuit judge ruled again that the emergency clause was passed improperly. That's now in the Supreme Court's hands again to potentially overturn that ruling. Make no mistake about it, this is not just about the Learns Act. Griffin says while the entire fight is over the emergency clause for the Learns Act, which has already gone into effect, there's a bigger picture that makes this still worth fighting for since so many other laws were passed this same way. It impacts funding of our government. It impacts laws that have been passed uh, for years. It impacts criminal, criminal laws. Griffin argues that the Constitution was never violated when Learns Act was passed. The court's view of the law with regard to uh, how the legislature uh, votes and records their vote, it, it, it could impact any issue. Nolan, meantime, says it's the Constitution that makes this case important for our state. I think ultimately Arkansans across the state are paying attention to whether or not the Arkansas Constitution means anything. They can call that what they will, but those are real, substantive, legal issues that are at stake here. The Learns Act officially went into effect on August 1st, but the appeal process, that's not over yet. Both sides have filed briefs arguing their case. Allie Nolan and her team have asked the Supreme Court to either dismiss the appeal as being moot 
or in favor of the circuit court's decision. The attorney general's office wants the case dismissed without being moot, while also asking for the circuit court's order to be reversed. As these legal lessons rage on, culture war struggles dominated the Arkansas legislature in the early part of the year. Some of the more glaring and controversial deal with bathrooms, libraries, and how to address transgender children. It's a social fight that carried from the halls of the state capitol to the hallways of our children's schools, leaving parents and teachers wondering, who do these laws protect? It's honestly a lot of anxiety. Um, I'm worried about how faculty and students are going to treat me. Simon Garbett is walking into his senior year at Robinson High School as the only openly transgender student. This year, Simon says he will have to stress about more things than before, like which bathroom he's allowed to use. It's insane to me that that's something that people think that they can control is where I go to the bathroom. On Capitol Avenue sits a building you can see from afar, the Arkansas State Capitol. Inside, lawmakers passed many education bills during the 94th legislative session. One of those laws passed is Act 542, known as the Given Name Act, where teachers and faculty members must have written permission from a student's parent or guardian before they can use their preferred name or pronouns. But even if permission is given, school employees can still choose to not call them by that name or pronoun. And it's a policy where we can have schools put in place where um, every school across the state can understand that it's really the parents involved and there's, we can't force someone, we can't compel someone's speech. I think the, the pronoun bill will have one of the biggest impacts. It's quite ironic to me because the, the act title for the bill is to protect teachers and yet it's creating a way for teachers to be sued. There's just an, an added level of tension and apprehension apprehension going in because of, quite frankly, of the legislature injecting itself where it doesn't belong. Liz Garbett is Simon's mom and she says she worries as a parent how this new legislation will impact her child. And we are spending our taxpayer dollars to legislate and to um, make hateful laws for one or two percent of the population. We are going to make sure that all of our students are getting a great education. It's not really a place for us to be uh, forcing a political, more political ideology. Not only does some of the legislation impact pronouns in bathrooms, but Act 372 is a law enacted about libraries having, selling, or distributing obscene materials that could be harmful for minors. There's a whole thing, so much for kids to learn, positive things for kids to learn. It's really not a place in school for pornography and those kind of things. It's just hurtful, like saying that my stories are undeserving of being told. It's, it's, it's the parent's job to parent the children. And if they don't like what their children are checking out at the library, then they need to be more hands on. As Simon thinks about his senior year, he says this attack on transgender students has to stop. But Representative Mary Bentley says students like Simon won't feel any impact. I don't think they'll feel any difference. I don't see any difference whatsoever what they've been doing every day at school. Um, I think that these are policies that have been in place before. They just weren't written down. So now that we've written them down, they can uh, just follow exactly what they've been doing before. I'm just a person, and I, as a person, I should be allowed to have those fundamental rights as a person. And it's really harmful and it's really hateful that people think that they can just erase me and that they can erase us. Several Arkansas libraries have joined with organizations, including the ACLU, to file a lawsuit over Act 372, a law they claim is a form of censorship that endangers librarians. The lawsuit was filed on June 2nd. It challenges sections one through five of the act, arguing they violate the first and 14th constitutional amendments regarding freedom of speech and equal protection. It also claims that the law is too vague, not thoroughly describing what's inappropriate or harmful to minors means. As we've seen tonight, education in Arkansas is a multi-million dollar investment. It's as important to the heads of state as it is to the heads of every household across the state. And right now, all of the questions are pointing toward one woman, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. After the break, why she feels Arkansas Learns is the best path forward.
It remains to be seen how Arkansas Learns will impact our children in the coming years or how many legal challenges it will face. But if history has taught us anything about education in Arkansas, the final chapter will continue to evolve. As we march into the future of Learns, tonight we hear from the Education Commander-in-Chief, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders, on why she feels this education overhaul is needed. What was it that made you want to focus so heavily on education in Arkansas? For me, it's really simple. I'm a parent. I see it every day. I have a sixth grader, a fourth grader, and a second grader. I know the difference that a quality education makes. But not all Arkansans are on board with LEARNS. Much of the public pushback coming from CAPES, Citizens for Arkansas Public Education and Students, falling less than 1,000 signatures short of getting LEARNS in front of voters. More than 50,000 people signed a petition wanting to get LEARNS on the ballot. You already know there are people who greatly oppose it. Do you think there's anything your administration can do to maybe win some of them over? Well, we are doing that. And you know, I think one of the things is that there's a lot of coverage on the handful of people that are fighting against LEARNS. But what I think is being left out of the story is the fact that I campaigned on this issue for two years. Not only were people supportive of an overhaul of our education system, but of the specific one that I laid out. Otherwise, frankly, I wouldn't be sitting here right now as governor of Arkansas. In addition, it opens up the opportunity for Governor Sanders has options. held town halls around the state with Education Secretary Jacob Oliva trying to convince the critics. Tackling education in Arkansas, a tall order. The most recent ACT Aspire report card shows benchmark test scores in math, science, and English low across the board. How will LEARNS help make the grade? There's not one silver bullet that's going to answer every education challenge that we have in the state, but there are some critical pieces that, frankly, Arkansas has missed. The governor says literacy is one of them. LEARNS puts a lot of focus on third grade reading. Right now, um, Arkansas third graders, only about 35 percent, are reading at or above a third grade reading level. We have more than a dozen counties where we only have 10% or less of Arkansas third graders hitting that critical benchmark. To help fix that, the state has hired 75 literacy coaches in classrooms around the state. LEARNS also tackles the bookends of education from early childhood development to career readiness. One of the pieces of LEARNS that I'm really proud of is the dual diploma track, which allows high school students to get certification while they are students so that the second they graduate, they are literally going straight into the job market. Governor Sanders says the heart of LEARNS is based on programs in other states that worked. Take a state like Mississippi, for instance. They were constantly ranked at the bottom with Arkansas when it came to literacy scores. They're now 22 in the country and we're still at the bottom because they implemented similar programs in literacy like we are doing. How long do you think it'll take before we start to see transformational change? I mean, I think we are going to start to see the impact immediately. Now, are we going to jump to 22 like Mississippi overnight? No, but I think we will see immediate change and success. Uh, uh, in certain areas over the course of the next couple of years, for sure. Despite what yeah, many no. say are positive aspects of LEARNS, some feel it weakens public education by allowing students to transfer to non-public schools through vouchers. To that, she says, Read the legislation. Every penny that a public school was getting before, they still get. Now they're just getting significant additional funding on top of that that will better their teachers, provide more resources, and frankly help students be more successful long term. How successful the Arkansas Learns Act will be remains to be seen. Tonight, we were able to teach you a lesson in these important areas. We've followed the money of this massive education overhaul that's expected to cost the state $815 million over three years. And as it is implemented, who's in control will have a major impact on our school districts and our students. 
We've also seen how teachers are on this new learning curve with their students as the old school way blends with the new school way of doing things. And finally, and most important, we are all watching to see what's next in the Learns Act legal fight. As we learn more in this chapter of the state's education journey, we will be looking to our state's leaders for guidance. And as this new course is still being charted, it's our hope that when it comes to schooling Arkansas, this education challenge will be one of our state's greatest achievements. I'm Donna Terrell. And I'm Laura Monteverdi. Good night.